Hi, I'm Sean Gregory from Time, and we're here for 10 questions with Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL. Commissioner, thanks for a few minutes here. Great to be with you. Great. First question comes from Woodland, Washington. Why weren't you harder on Michael Vick? I would have liked to see him banned from the NFL completely. Well, then I think there's only one thing I could have done to make him happy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I understand the emotion that comes with that. Uh, you know, what Michael did was horrific and, uh, and to many people inexcusable, and I certainly understand that position. Uh, but I also um, hope to see people succeed in life. And um, this is a young man who paid a very heavy price uh, in addition to spending time in a federal prison uh, for a couple of years. Uh, he lost millions of dollars and an opportunity to pursue a, a career. And as long as he demonstrated to, to me and to the NFL that he was serious about um, making a, a, a difference and making changes in his life to make better judgments and that he could actually serve as a positive message uh, out there, he has an opportunity to take a negative and turn it into a positive. And uh, whether Michael Vick throws another a pass in the NFL or not, it doesn't matter if he can serve a purpose of demonstrating that you can make mistakes and recover from them. What has been the single most difficult decision you have had to make since becoming commissioner? That's a question I get asked frequently, and I, I would tell you that it's difficult to put your finger on one specific decision. Um, but I would tell you in general, uh, when you're dealing with the future of young men, uh, whether it's player health and safety, whether you're dealing with a personal conduct policy, and whether uh, someone's going to be eligible to play in the NFL. Those are some of the toughest decisions you make because you really want to understand the facts. You want to make sure that you understand where that young man is and what you can do to help that young man be successful, more importantly, off the field than on the field. And so I spend an awful lot of time making sure I understand where that individual is and what the facts are and hopefully making a decision that will uh, benefit them throughout the life and benefit a lot of other young people who are watching those decisions. Why punish Ben Roethlisberger if he wasn't found guilty on the sexual harassment charge? Well, one of the premises of our personal conduct policy is, uh, is a pattern. Uh, and when there's a pattern of making bad decisions or putting yourself in a position where it reflects poorly on you, your team, your family, your community, the NFL in general, that that's time for early intervention. And I truly believe in the case of Ben as one example, um, that he was making a series of decisions that uh, were not going to benefit him long term. And he needed to change his life and he needed to, to evaluate where he was, get help to make better decisions. And I think he's in a much better place. Uh, as I've said before, it's not whether he continues to be successful on the field. I would like to see Ben be successful in life. And, and I think he will be. Commissioner, as you know, there have been accusations of inappropriate uh, text messages sent uh, from Brett Favre uh, to a sideline reporter from the New York Jets two years ago. What are you going to do about Brett Favre? We're going to first understand the facts, uh, understand exactly what happened. Uh, and then once we understand the facts, we'll apply our policy uh, as we have in the past consistently and make sure that we're making the best decision for the NFL and for the individual. I qualify that with an if, um, but if these text messages were sent, th th does the fact that it's a workplace uh, workplace setting make this more serious? Perhaps? It does. Uh, it's ex it's exactly uh, the issue with our personal conduct policy. Uh, is that you know we have to uh, ensure that our workplaces are um, safe, uh, that they are positive, and that people do not feel threatened in our workplaces and. Um, that's one of the things that we'll certainly be focused on. Uh, this, this question comes from Denver. There's one question that every NFL fan wants to know. Will there be football next year, or are we heading towards a lockout? Well, I sure hope we're going to be playing football, and I sure hope that we're going to get this agreement resolved sooner rather than later. Uh, we'll work night and day to, to make sure that happens, uh, because I think it's important for our fans, it's important for the players, and certainly important for the teams. Uh, so we want to get this done quickly. You know, it's billionaires versus millionaires, whoever you want to characterize it. There's frustration. Are you sure. prepared for that, you know, what's sure to be some, uh, some outrage if this drags on? I, I've said repeatedly uh, that if we're unable to reach an agreement that makes sense for the, for the two basic parties, 
that everyone will have plenty of blame to go around. Commissioner, for years the NFL has had a blackout policy where if a stadium is not sold out with their general admission seats 70, 72 hours in advance of kickoff, uh, the game is not shown in the local market. Uh, do you think that continuing to blackout games will gain you more fans, especially in this economic climate? This is not the first economic downturn that we've had while we've had the blackout policy. Uh, that's not the reason to, in itself to, to look at it. But we have looked at how uh, we've ad addressed all of our ticket policies to make sure that we can make our game affordable for everyone to come and to make it easier for our fans to be able to get in the stadium so that we can have all of our games shown on live, te live television. That's what we want to be, and that's what we'll continue to strive for. Commissioner, thanks. Good to see you. Thanks very much. Thank you. You bet.